Exploring these ancient ring forts is a reminder to me that in our ancient past, people got together as communities because we had to protect against existential threats. Wild animals and marauding invaders are what we had to worry about then. Thousands of years ago, tribal leaders sat around campfires like this one and decided these forts needed to be built to preserve the community here for generations to come. And it's probably because our ancestors defended themselves with forts like this that we're still here today. But now the world has changed. We now live in a globalised community and the greatest threats we face are a symptom of our own success. Now all the world's governing bodies, scientific institutions and even military are warning that environmental factors combined with competition for resources are a greater threat to peace and life on Earth than any other issue today. Finally, the world's leaders are listening to the warnings and negotiating a plan to contain the worst case trajectory from happening. Almost every country, including Ireland, are agreeing to a complete shift in the way we power our economies into the future. This ambition is so big that it sets out to not only contain the worst impacts of climate change, but to end our reliance and use of fossil fuels for good. But is all this really possible? Just as the decision to build these walls had a huge impact on the people that lived here over a thousand years ago, the agreements in Paris now will have a profound effect on the future of all life on Earth in the years ahead. In this episode, I'm going to explore what this really means for you and me. I've been talking about climate change for over 25 years, but now is the first time I've seen mass awareness and a global recognition that political action is necessary. A political momentum like this may not come again. There are over 20,000 official delegate representatives from 196 countries all here to negotiate a universal consensus. Rarely in human history have so many people around the world placed their trust in so few. This event in Paris is regarded as the last chance for a global agreement on how to deal with climate change. But it's also the first time there's a real feeling of hope that a new direction could be possible. We are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. For the conference to be a success, all the world's governments have to ratify an agreement. And most importantly, that agreement has to be strong enough to halt runaway climate change. Let us all together, everybody, send out the signal that the world is waiting for. And let us not deprive our successors and their children of a real future before they are born. Thank you. But I'm here to learn what world leaders are signing us up to and what all this means for Ireland. So are you all from Ireland? Yeah. yeah. So are you all on a trip here, yeah? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Tell us about your trip. Uh, there's 35 of us here, um, sort of an umbrella organisation, Stop Climate Chaos, made up of people from Trokera, uh, Trokera, yeah. Antashka, Antashka, Antashka. Antashka. Um, I'm a lecturer in DIT. DIT, yeah. We want to come here and then come back and, you know, get the inspiration from all these people here. We need to be going from the ground up now as well, because from the, from the bottom, from the top down, and then Kenny is greenwashing, he's not doing that, so we need to take action ourselves and we need to, we need to do it ourselves. Yeah. The people on the ground are getting it, the political system hasn't got it. We were too preoccupied with economic recovery. Now it's time to change the focus to the preeminent issue of our time, which is climate. One of the most alarming effects of climate change is the large-scale melting of glacial ice around the world. 
This discharge of melting ice is raising sea levels at an accelerating rate. I asked world-renowned glaciologist and climate scientist, Professor Jason Box, why this conference is so significant in addressing this issue. Hi, Jason. Thanks for meeting me yes. here. What's with the ice here? Well, this ice comes from Greenland, and this installation is you know, bringing the Arctic to Paris. And I think it's a very powerful communication tool because you know, it, it's more powerful than a thousand page report. And it tells us uh, it, in the shape of a clock, the ice is melting fast in the Arctic and also the Antarctic. And that's adding up to not only sea level rise, but changing ocean circulation in the North Atlantic that has immediate impacts on the weather and climate of Europe. We have record cold sea surface temperatures right now in the North Atlantic at the same time that the world is record warm. That conspicuous pattern is actually driving um, stronger storms that are pointed right to Ireland. So you'll, you'll see stronger storms going forward and, and what disruption that has, uh, I, I think you know better than I do. Just last month, NASA came out with a statement saying that we're committed to at least one meter of sea level rise. That means adding up all of the contributions from land ice around the world and thermal expansion, we cannot um, see any way that we're looking at less than one meter of sea level rise by end of century. Then there's the upper end. And if we're committed to at least one meter of sea level rise, and this could be what, two or three meters maybe? The way things yeah, are going. Maybe. This is going to be massive for all of us. That really depends on the policies that come out here in Paris. The, the path that we choose going into the future should be very ambitious because we want to keep temperatures as low as we can. Uh, we, the, the more we let temperatures rise, the more time we let uh, slip by, um, the, the faster the ice goes. So how quickly have we got to get off burning fossil fuel? We need to get off the burning of fossil fuels like yesterday. We, we're already overloaded. Uh, we're at 400 parts per million. The last time CO2 was that high in the atmosphere, global sea level was at least 13 meters higher. And is time on our side? I mean, is time not running out? I would say we're out of time. We're out of time. So, so we have to make some tough decisions now uh, for the sake of our children, for the sake of our coastlines, for the sake of our nations, for the sake of stability. Uh, it's, I think it's a no-brainer. It's, it's not going to be easy, but there'll be a lot of uh, benefits, uh, rewards for that hard work. Jason's message about future threats of sea level rise are sobering. But 90% of world's nations are already seeing profound effects of a changing climate. On my way back to the UN conference at Le Bourget, there was news of a historic breakthrough. After more than 20 years of failed attempts, in Paris on December the 12th, 2015, all 196 world nations finally signed the world's first global agreement on climate change. How important is this decision? This is a really historic day, Duncan, because it is the first time that every country from the United Nations, we're talking about nearly 200 countries, have agreed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to keep us well below two degrees centigrade of additional warming. And in fact, they're aiming to keep us below 1.5 degrees of additional warming because that's what they believe is, is safe for humanity to continue to exist. And will they achieve this from what the outcome of this today? We know, based on what these countries have committed to do today, that they won't be able to keep us below two, two degrees. In fact, we're looking at maybe three degrees or more of warming based on what these countries have committed. So they need to go back and they need to do more and they need to be more ambitious than what they've committed to today. But it's a start. Right, so we're not on track. So where are the deficiencies? So we have these grand aspirational goals of a two and a, even a one and a half degree C temperature rise. Um, across the century, and yet then when you look at the rest of the text, there is no reference to what we call carbon budgets, which is the scientific framing um, that we need to look at climate change. That's how much carbon dioxide we can emit across the century for these particular uh, temperatures. Uh, there's no reference to the concept of decarbonisation, as we call it. 
Um, there's no reference to a peak year, just the idea we must peak global emissions as soon as possible. Uh, there's no reference to any levels that we must try and achieve, so there's no numerical emphasis on this at all. The only real numbers in the new report are these aspirational targets of one and a half and two degrees C temperature rise and page numbers. Lobbying from special interest groups and coal and oil producing nations had led to an undue influence in softening the final agreement. Exposing the lobbyists was a growing global civil movement that pressured politicians to reach an agreement. Large-scale protests had been planned to coincide with the Paris Conference, but the recent terrorist attacks led to a state of emergency where all public gatherings were banned. Despite this ban, tens of thousands of people from all over the world took to the streets to ensure their voices were heard. Civil action played a huge part in focusing politicians during the negotiations. A new class of activists have rallied awareness and movements through social media all over the world. One of the main architects of these civil actions is Nicola Herringer of 350.org. Do you think that enough has been done in COP21 to deliver a safe climate to the citizens of the world? Definitely not. Um, I think governments are listening, that is true. I think there were very nice speeches made in Le Bourget. And I think we have to acknowledge that the problem is not awareness anymore or a battle on um, uh, the science. It's neither a problem of solution, because we know how to tackle the issue. We have all the evidence and knowledge to do that. So it's, it is a political problem. And, and politics begin when you move from speech to public decisions, to action. And this is where the problem begins and happens. So this is where we have to mobilize and make sure that states do act. It's not just about engineers having to find a solution to provide the same amount of energy, but in a clean way. It's a democratic question. In spite of the heavy police presence, this peaceful protest brought a festival atmosphere to the streets of Paris. Under the Eiffel Tower, I ran into an Irish NGO who also had a stake in witnessing this historic event. Lorna, why is COP21 so important to Trocra? Well, Duncan, this is the first time that all countries in the world have come together to agree on a global climate agreement. I think unless our political leaders wake up to that, they're going to be increasingly out of step with the broad consensus and the broad uh, global view that's, that's moving forward now. So for us in Trocra, and we've been working on it for nearly 10 years now, this is an absolute priority. Unless this deal is successful and implemented, uh, all the efforts we make to try and show solidarity with people in the developing world will be an uphill struggle, if not in vain. We also, as a country, have to look at how we're financing climate change adaptation. Our, our, you could say our solidarity with the developing world. Pope Francis calls it our ecological debt, which is a very powerful term. We have a debt to pay to the developing world in relation to climate change. So far, we've offered two million euros to the Green Climate Fund. That's 50 cents per head of um, population in Ireland. Most countries are offering in the develop developed world around 10 euros per head of population. We have to recognise that we need to step up now. Do you think that the developed world is listening to you and taking your concerns seriously? Two, three degrees in Africa, it has another impact, it has another meaning. It will look like we, are, we have raised like more than five, six degrees. So that's why we are, we are going to be roasted and we're going to die. We, countries like Mozambique and other African countries, we didn't contribute to the climate problems that we are facing now. But actually, we are committed to do more than what the ones who created the problems are committed to do. Two thousand and fifteen exceeded the highest average global temperatures on record. This has led to record levels of extreme weather, crop failures, wildfires, flooding, and droughts. 
which has increased conflicts and migration in many parts of the world. Professor Jan Egeland works at the front lines of these issues. Do you see major problems with migrations in the future? Well, listen, migration is already on us. Climate, weather-related events is causing 22 million people to leave their homes already every single year. If we fail here, it will be a hundred times worse, possibly, in the future. Climate change is not helping a conflict resolution. It means that many more people are more exposed to extreme weather. When there is bad governance on top of that and conflict, it all becomes a lethal cocktail. And of course, young people end up losing hope in the future. And then there's only two things, become bitter and extreme or leave for better places elsewhere, like Europe or North America. The link between climate change, migration and conflict has become a central discussion point in all climate change negotiations. I talked to Professor Francois Germain, a political scientist who is studying these links. If you take a situation like in Ireland or anywhere in Europe, we're burning fossil fuel. We go to filling stations and fill our cars with petrol and we use coal and we use gas. Are we causing part of this damage in terms of global conflicts? Obviously, yes. I mean, of course, it's unintended and we don't realize it. But the more we depend on fossil fuels and on oil in particular, the more we are likely to fuel more conflicts. In the past, energy issues have been at the roots of many conflicts. Many conflicts or even terrorist attacks were related or funded by oil. I mean, if you take the Gulf Wars, for example, they were obviously related to oil, it makes no doubt that this relationship will be exacerbated and that a warmer world will also be a more violent world. If we move towards renewable sources of energy, these renewable resources will be more evenly distributed, will be available for free and will be in unlimited supply, which means that there will no longer be a competition for these resources. What makes me hopeful and optimistic is the fact that finally people seems to, seem to have realized that climate change was a political issue and not an environmental issue, and that there were collective choices involved, and I'm hoping that we'll have the ability to make these bold, courageous collective choices before it is too late. Are you optimistic that we can get back to a safe climate? We have to invest much more in, in meeting in, in uh, getting down emissions, number one, but also in adaptation, in building defense mechanisms. Uh, if not, tens of millions of people more will be displaced every year. What do you say in that context to a country or a government that says, we can't afford to take risks on the economy of our country to solve climate change? Well, I say the green future will be a good future. Ireland can do a lot of green energy. You have a lot of, a lot of wind. You, you have a lot of opportunities to also create green energy. It will be a good society, but it will be different. What we do not do today, we may regret in 20, 30, 40 years. And our children and grandchildren will turn back and say, were you absolutely mad? Didn't you even read uh, the scientific evidence? Why didn't you? change your manners. Reflecting on the Paris Agreement, it's clear that this historic milestone is signaling a new direction to protect our children, the natural world and future generations. However, without clear binding targets, sanctions and an effective mechanism to drive the change, we're now solely reliant on voluntary efforts of nations to act and share this daunting burden fairly. It's now clear that it's up to the citizens of all countries to make sure their governments keep to their promise. Returning to Ireland during yet another one in 100 year flood event, the issue of climate change is starting to hit home. Warmer oceans leads to more evaporation, more moisture and more energy in the atmosphere. 
which for us means amplifying more extreme storms and flood events. Added to this, rising sea levels will inevitably cause large-scale coastal inundation. The scale of these problems is all dependent on how urgently the world reduces its greenhouse gas emissions. If Ireland is committed to its fair share in this new global ambition to limit global warming, it raises the question what the Paris Agreement will mean for all of us in Ireland. Professor Barry McMullen is Executive Dean of Engineering at DCU and Chair of the Climate Change Committee at Antashka. Barry, world nations have finally agreed on climate change to hold to a two degree and even a 1.5 degree target. Is that achievable? It's a great target. They haven't agreed how to get there. They haven't agreed the implementation. They haven't agreed realistic means to get there. In effect, the world's politicians have agreed that they can't fix this from the top down, that it has to come from the bottom up, that the world's citizens have to be sufficiently exercised and sufficiently engaged to take the scale of action that would be necessary. But there's no detail on that scale of action. And to be honest, there isn't the kind of honest engagement with citizens to explain what the scale of action would be or the urgency of it as yet. Currently, Ireland is obliged under the EU Climate and Energy Framework to reduce emissions by 40% by 2030. I asked Barry if achieving these targets would bring Ireland in line with this new global agreement. Those targets are wholly inadequate to meet the temperature goal that has now been set in Paris. We should be aiming for something much more like 80% reductions by 2030. That's 80, much 80%, 80 instead of 40%. Instead of 40%. That's much, much more aggressive than anybody is talking about. But the only way can, we can do that is if in Europe we're saying, and we in Ireland will do our part. Whereas at the moment, to be honest, what we're saying in Europe is that actually, well, 40% by 2030 is going to be hugely challenging for Ireland. and We will have to get a special deal to not do too much or not as much as some other countries do. And that's really not a basis to argue for strong ambition. I'd like to say this is a long-term transition, that we would have 50 or 60 or 100 years to do it. But unfortunately, it's too late for that. We're now looking at having to make this transition probably in as little as 30 years to essentially eliminate fossil fuels uh, from our way of life. So how do we in Ireland implement these massive changes when typically politicians don't really take this seriously because they don't see votes in it? Well, that's fair, Duncan. They don't currently see votes in it. And uh, that's partly a failure of political leadership, we have to acknowledge, that they're not communicating what's necessary. But it's also a failure on the part of citizens to realise that this now requires bottom-up action from them. We need to stop thinking in terms of what can we tolerate or what's possible. We have to ask what's actually necessary to solve this problem. And whatever's necessary, we have to make that possible and we have to engage with those actions. But again, uh, citizen engagement, citizen argument, citizen campaigning is absolutely essential to that. Over many years of making this series, I've explored lots of ways Ireland could move to a sustainable future while maintaining good living standards and building resilience into our economy. All these issues require new and better governance and policies that will only happen if there's public demand. It's amazing to think monuments like this were built thousands of years ago and still stand today. I love being reminded of how far we've come. But it worries me. If climate change is allowed to get out of control, then all these amazing coastal civilizations that we've built won't be here for future generations. The future of all species on Earth is literally at stake. The worst can only be prevented if there's mass engagement, a bottom-up and a top-down approach, like we had when these walls were built.